I would include Calvin with this. And so, uh, you know, I would say uh, this is prior to uh, the, the Bartholomew's Day Massacre, where we see this, this kind of thinking. Uh, but the question becomes, uh, uh, Calvin, can we, uh, what can we do? Uh, what can we do against uh, the French uh, oppression of Protestants? And, and the short answer is, uh, if there is to be any resistance, uh, it needs to be done by some kind of legitimate public authority. Uh, you know, in Calvin's letters, he speaks of a, a prince of the blood, somebody immediately uh, who had some uh, some legitimate uh, connection to the crown uh, ought to be leading this. Uh, and, and I don't go into it in the paper, but I would argue that this is simply Calvin being a natural law thinker. Uh, it's the same kind of thing that you see in Thomas Aquinas. Uh, what do you? What is a legitimate war? For Thomas, uh, the first and most important criterion is that it must be done by a public authority. Uh, if it's not done by a public authority, you, you simply lose all order. Uh, and, and so you see this kind of thinking being developed, uh, I think, by Calvin. Now, uh, post-Calvin, with the rise of uh, significant persecution, uh, uh, people like uh, uh, Philip de Mornay, uh, author of The Vindication Against Tyranny, writes this uh, justification for resistance. And uh, in the paper, uh, I try to show that I think that this, this very influential document is really not a different, it's not a different species than, than Calvin's political thought on the question, even though it's much more developed as a legal document. Uh, he's, the author is very clear that resistance specifically by private individuals uh, is is not permitted, but uh, in in some kind of capacity, uh, as Calvin argued in the last chapter of the Institutes, uh, there are some magistrates who are legitimate magistrates who have uh, I know that he uses the word right, but they have a right and a duty to check the power of a licentious prince. 